So hi Whitney, um, thank you for meeting with me today. My name's Alex um, and I'm one of the Royal Commissioners um, and it's great that you have given us the time to have a chat this afternoon. So thanks very much. Um, and obviously I've had a chance to read your witness statement, but before we go into that, how are things going for you at, you know, at this point? How are things for you in the second wave of lockdown? <laughs> um, <laughs> Look, um, yeah, pretty good. I guess you, you're just going to sit there and laugh about it. You know, there's not much you can do. I guess we all saw it coming. But, yeah, no, I'm doing it all right. At least it's locked down. I've got my siblings with me and their mum. So I'm not alone this time <laughs> with three kids. <laughs> Fantastic. So you're getting some help and stuff? Uh, yeah. Like, in a way, it's not really more help. It's more, you know, I've got their, you know, at least communication with other humans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a tricky time, isn't it, for all of us? Well, I, I wanted to sort of head towards your statement and, um, you know, it, it was a, a really strong statement for us to read and hear about your, um, just what's happened to you over, you know, the, the time um, that you describe. Do you want to just sort of start with what you'd like to tell about your story and as you're doing that, reflect on things that you think helped you along that way, like things that were actually helpful to you? Okay. Um, where where would you like well, me to your, start? Your story starts incredibly young. I mean, you, you yes, describe it. Yes, it starts when I was a baby. So, you know, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, when people usually ask me, where would you like me to start? It's like, okay, where would you like me to start? Which point of my life? Um, okay, so from my point of view, I guess where you remember things that were going on for you, not what you were told, but what you experienced. Uh, okay, well, it uh, probably goes from around about six years old. Um, I remember um, just being in and out of my mum's care, barely being around her. Um, I was never let have friends over. There's obviously domestics, um, and that's whenever I was with my mum. And otherwise, I'd always be dumped at my step uh, my stepdad's mum's place. Um, so she is the woman who basically kind of raised me up. Um, and when I did get removed from mum's care from time to time, I'd be moving to her. So it was always in a lot of circles, um, and probably approximately around about the age of eight, seven, eight, I think. Um, I entered into foster care. Um, and I was in and out of foster care, um, and I've went through a few, you know, a few foster families. Um, I guess, you know, unfortunately it's not always what you always seem like, you know, foster families are there to help you, um, to, you know, be there, protect you, stuff like that. But, you know, most foster parents weren't always the brightest and they always treated you different. Um, and I guess, you know, um, there's obviously a lot of abuses, um, but obviously I always had one let down to another to, to another and you know so I had a lot of heartbreaks and my only best friend I had was my my mum's dog which is you know my friend um so yeah basically um uh, once I was in that foster care I found finally a good foster family um I was with them for about approximately two years um and they were going to adopt me and which you know when I broke it to me it was great news you know they were a lovely family you know they brought me into a Christian life you know where I found Christ and stuff like that and I was going I could see my life going to a good path and then um I guess when um they asked me I said yes um the next day my mum calls me and she told me she was seven and a half months pregnant with my brother and I had to kind of reject their adoption and I've told them that I needed to go home to help you know with my brother so I left my foster family went home back to my mother all I remember was that the department obviously was still involved um and they ended up removing me from my mother's care and I told them you know I was not going to another foster family if I can't have a family of my own I can't do this anymore you know it was too much of a heartache for me so they put me in residential units and I guess that was a day where my whole life went wow and downhill and I didn't expect it to be the way it was meant to be. And um, that's when, um, unfortunately, I was like, what, 12 years old when I ended up in a residential unit. The first night I was there, I lost my virginity. Um, they were in, into absconding, you know, stealing cars, you know, doing drugs and stuff like that. And obviously being so young and I was the youngest that was in there, you know, you don't get many 
11, 12 year olds, you know, in residential units, you know, probably now is a bit different, but back then, no. So, um, you know, me trying to fit in and obviously it was very scary and stuff. Um, I just went with the flow and then I guess mm. um, that's what was life, like, you know, running around the streets, you know, drinking, smoking, doing drugs, um, you know, doing reckless stuff and there was no one to stop you, you know. Um, and then so, I remember... So, um, so I was just going to ask that, you know, during that time um, around that 11-year-old stuff and when you're being um, in and out of, um, you know, going back to with your mum and then, and then not... Um, did you get any support? Does anyone kind of, I understand the process of the system, you know, people are putting you in and out of care and stuff, but is anyone actually kind of looking out for you, looking after you? Not really. Like, you? The, the department was meant to, you know, obviously do that, but um, they obviously did link me up with counselling. I can't exactly remember how young because, you know, but I do recall doing a lot of counselling. I just can't exactly remember when it started. Did it feel like it was doing anything? Like even I know you can't remember the detail, but did you have a sense any of that was helping? Not really, because um, what what would they know? You know what what would they care? You know, at the end of the day, they have a job to do, and they're sitting there talking about my problems. And I guess at that point of stage time, I didn't want to I didn't want to talk about it. You know, it's just like after a heartbreak, after heartbreak, crying and that. But to be honest, I don't think the department ever put me into counselling until um. I end up in residential units and so that's when they're like, okay, you know, this and that and they try to, I just don't know exactly where it started, but that's the only support I really had. And um, I remember at some point, I just never wanted to go back to my resident unit, you know, what's the point? You know, like, what are you guys going to do? There's nothing there. It's just like a roof. We can come and go as we please. There's no restrictions, nothing, you know? So is there any chance you're getting to school? I'm presuming not, but is um, there any chance you're trying to get to school? Well, no, yeah, actually, I'm pretty sure once I end up in a residential unit, school was out the picture. I did go to school through year seven, year eight, um, and then year nine. I don't know exactly how I passed year seven, year eight, but um, I wasn't there much. Um, so, yes, I was. I went back to my foster parents, I'm pretty sure, for a little bit before I ended up in a residential unit. I don't recall going to school. The only time I ever did was somewhere through year nine, and I think that was two, three res units after my first one because the first one was a um, contingency unit. So that's just only temporary. And I remember that I was there for months. And then um, once I went to another one, I think I got kicked out of that one and went to another one. Yeah, that's when I started going to. Like it wasn't even a proper high school. It was like one of those ones for travel teens, stuff like that. It's like, you know, very flexible. And even they even bribed me going to school by buying me a slab of Red Bull, or, you know, the mineral water, so stuff like that. And like you can have one a day if you, you know, come to school. But, you know, it's not like I had too much work, just lays around and stuff like that, you know. Um, but one thing I appreciated was the school actually did try and make an effort with me going there. You know, they did see a lot of potential and stuff like that. And obviously I was really so lost in having so much fun doing whatever, you know. I didn't know what life was apart from that. That's, you know, I like mm. end up in a residential, you know, when I was 12, you know. It's just like that's all I knew run wild free that's fun you know being that young get all the free world of course yeah. you're hardly going to make good decisions but anyway, yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> so um and plus my cousins are already you know there and stuff like that and you know obviously my cousins were in that scene and you know i'm jumping in stolen cars and stuff like that i didn't have any concepts of what i was going to get myself into and then obviously mm -hmm. when my cousin and his friend got um done this and that and we uh, ended up getting catched by the police because I'm pretty sure there was actually helicopters and police dogs and stuff like that. I was actually beyond my beliefs. Mind you, I've never stolen a car in my life. <laughs> you know, I didn't know what would it, what effect it would take. I'm just like, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, I I really didn't care what was going to happen. Like, charge me. This sounded like, you know, I never had the concept of understanding what being charged and what is actually serious going to do for your future because I didn't see a future. Like, you know, I actually had a modeling career going when I was 13, but um, I ended up letting that go because I wanted to stay and smoke weed and I had my friends, you know, and just like, well, mm. what's the big deal? You know, and now I sit back and look at it, it's like there were so many opportunities that I had that I threw away, but what is the, what is the department doing? They weren't doing anything. Yeah, they, they linked me up with this cancer thing. Um, they just sat there and spoke about it and, and all it did was bring up so much pain. And it's like, well, and you know, and I, I've gone through a lot of different counselors and they're like, okay, so how can I help you? Talk to me. What do you mean? How can you help me? I don't know. That's why I'm here. You know, like, I don't know why I'm here. Apparently I'm here because you're meant to help me. You know what I mean? What, what do you think makes a good counsellor having been through so many? What, what do you think makes a good counsellor? Um, what makes a good counsellor is 
coming down and not trying to sit there and pretend that they care or understand exactly what you're going through, but at least they're trying to understand and, you know, work with you. Like I can't exactly, know. I think it's just, you know, you can sense who actually cares and wants to do their job right. Like I've gone through so many counselors and I think I found one finally, you know, and I've been seeing for three years and I can't exactly describe, like I had him and my counselor and unfortunately she left, but they didn't force it on you. They didn't push you. You know, they, they were there. They left it and they kept letting you know that they were there. You know, I'm here if you want to talk this and that. And, you know, if you want a difference. And, like, you know, they they knew I needed it, but they didn't force me. Like, you know, the courts have put orders that I had to go see a counsellor and, you know, do this and do that. You know, and I'm that type of person. You can't tell me what to do. If you're going to force me to do something, I'm not going to do it. You know, you have to let me at my own pace. And when people sit there and force me, I'm not going to do it. You know, and at the end of the day, like they say, you know, you can't help someone who doesn't want help. It, even though I really wanted help, I was just too, you know, who's going to help me? Who's, who really cares about me? And that's the way I always grew up thinking. No one cares about me. You know, like I never really got the love and affection and I should have gone for my mother. You know, she was too lost in her own world. Okay, fair enough. You know, and then I had the issues with my dad. Like, why didn't he ever bother finding me? Why didn't he, you know, sit there and chase me? And that was like a lot of hurt, you know, and just like my family has rejected me, you know, and I was moving from home to home. You know, it's just like I felt worthless. And then obviously at that stage, I was all wrapped around about boys, you know, thinking I'll find someone that will love me for me, you know, and obviously boys never were like that, you know, they didn't care. And I just felt useless. And all I was, was an object for someone, you know, to use and abuse. And that's how I've always felt. So it just, damn, I didn't care. And like having someone who actually really cared about you makes a big difference in someone, you know, because a lot of people can tell between real and fake. And when you actually see someone that truly cares, it's like, why do you care about me? You don't know me. But they see something and they don't give up on you. That that's, makes a major difference, you know, into someone's life. And that's how it was. Um, Just one of the other things I was going to ask you about your current counsellor. I know we're skipping ahead a bit, but we're on the topic. Um, as you say, I can see in, in um, your statement, there's been quite a lot of people who either unfortunately they've moved jobs or it hasn't been the right fit, which is not uncommon. And so you've changed. What's the difference of having, I think this might be the first person you've had for three years. Like this seems like the longest I can see. What's the difference about the kind of capacity to stay with someone and be supported with someone who has got, is over the longer time? Um, yeah, the capacity. Um... What, what does that, how, how does that make a difference to you? The fact that, you know, you've got someone that's actually been with you for the three years rather than, flipping and changing because he, he 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 um has been with me through my journey you know i didn't have to sit there and repeat like he he was there with me so i didn't have to repeat and you know, he understood what i was going through and i didn't go through it alone you know even though i felt like it he was there so i wasn't walking down that path of those difficult choices or when i had you know like things that just come on upon me and it's like well what wait a minute i had someone else sit there okay and talk to me through it okay what's going on yep yep and because i've ha had this journey they already know i don't have to sit through repeat and they've gotten to know who i am and i've gotten we've had that trust you know that um that kind of builds friendship in like it's not a friendship you know what i'm talking about um mm, connection and, of some kind yeah and it's just like i've gone through a lot of counselors and stuff like that and they've all diagnosed me like you've got severe depression and this and that you know and even when i went to the arc list and um and i had a psychologist and they're like okay you've been diagnosed with you know um borderline personality disorder this and that yeah, yeah, yeah. and i remember what i've been working for the last three years and even though he's still underlying on um diagnosing me but it's basically he has had that time and because he's not exactly a psychologist he is a psych nurse um which i keep calling a psychologist which apparently is two different things so <laughs> um but yeah um it's just working with him and you know he, he works at my pace you know he doesn't force it too much just that and he he's been walking with me through this journey he has seen me from when he first met me to now and that dramatic change and you know he always tells me you know you have done amazing when you look at you and you know he I, I i i criticize myself a lot and you know he boosts me like no whitney's not like that and obviously i'm always gonna have those negative thoughts but you know i feel like you know well i couldn't have done it alone you know you have been there yeah i've done it all myself but you've sat there and you've helped me talk through it and work through it and understand 
what is going through my mind, you know, why am I up and down, yada, 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 and try and work along with it. And if I wasn't too unsure, he would give me suggestions, you know. So that's what I'm saying. Like, it's, um, yeah, a very <laughs> long process, but I can't, yeah. It, he, he's definitely a lot different to the other cancers I've had. And I think there was one that I really, you know, I did connect and he was there for me. But unfortunately, with my circumstances with my ex-partner and he finding out that I was talking about the abuse, he shut me out completely. That was the one other counsellor that was actually really good. But to come across a very good counsellor or some support like that is very rare to find in this world, you know. And I understand, like, there, I've, I've got a lot of friends, you know, that are actually down in dumps and they have breakdowns and they feel like they want to end it and stuff like that. I'm like, look, even, like, my brother, you know, and he, and there's, there's people that shut out completely. And it's just like, I understand exactly where you come from. I know, you know, what's the point of sitting there talking to a counsellor, you know. You're going to sit there and repeat your story. It's not going to change the past. It's not going to change what's happened. It's not going to change how you feel. But, uh, you know, I'm trying to explain to them that, you know, you need to find that right person. There is someone out there that does care and that, you know, it is true. Just talking about it, what's going to change? It's going to change nothing, but it's going to make you open up and realise and talk through your problems and you'll be able to, you know, make that process and put that barrier down and be able to move on with your life, you know. And for me to sit there and encourage them, because, you know, it's just like, it has obviously made a big difference and you know i i can kind of sort of help people because i've been there and i've been here you know and even though at that point i'm even still sometimes these days i'm like what's it going to help what's it, what's it going to do and then you've got to sit there and take a step back like, okay well it's done all of this you know so um yeah can i ask you in the statement you talk about um i can't remember the quote but you know i've told my story a thousand and one times that's i think how you refer to it yes um what do you think, and, 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 you know, I think you and I, even in my limited understanding of this, you know, I think we could agree you've had a lot of contact with a lot of people in this system yeah. of various kinds. How do you think the system could reduce that sense that, you know, you've got to kind of keep telling the story? Your story, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of your story is kind of pretty challenging for you, I'm sure. And so, you know, you're going over and over and over it. Have you got any thoughts that you want us to think about in the commission about how to prevent that sense of starting at square one every time someone new comes near you? Well, look, I know um, some things are um, um, some things are already um, like it's very con uh, confidentiality. You know, like you've got to keep it confident. Um, but if whatever notes someone has written down, or you know, like have have concepts, or even if they don't write notes and they sit there and talk about it, like you know, at the end of the day, they should have whoever is going from next to the next is from saving that person sitting there explaining their story all over again that person who whoever has moved on or you know gone to a new work of this now instead of making them go through the, all that trauma or experience and bringing up these horrible thoughts that they don't want to go through they should be able to read you know have like you know it's just like a my health you know system you know how the ref records mm -hmm. it's something like that where okay I can get into this, yeah, 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 and they study, they read everything, you know, before, instead of getting a person to sit there and explain. And, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I know that some places are meant to be like that. Okay, well, we've got this, we've got this, but it's like, it's not the whole information, you know? And even if it's like bits and pieces from like this person, that person, they should all be able to combine it. And, you know, there's everything right there, you know? And look, it might be all over the place, someone should be able to sit there and okay let's just put this into order this into order so then they actually have an understanding so then the next person don't have to sit there and ask them if there's would would you be worried personally about um your i, I don't know if you got one but like a housing worker having your counseling information like does that worry you that the people that are in your support team if i could describe it that way yeah. have the others information would that worry you well, See, obviously there is um, confidentiality and that is where it's meant to, you know, obviously that means a lot and other work and stuff like that. For me personally, I honestly don't care, but I know there's other people that don't want certain support services finding out. Obviously that's where confidentiality falls into place. And obviously people need to give permission to say, okay, you're allowed to go through my file because I don't want to read my story all over again. Read that, you know, and have the opportunity there obviously with a permission okay like, which some places do do that okay um is it okay if i uh, able to access to your dhs files or stuff like that yeah not a problem go for it you know but as long as they've got a say in who gets to know about their life or what they've been through you know 
Yeah, that great sense. suggestion. Yeah. yeah, no, no, that's good. That's good. Okay, uh, um, uh, and happy to take any part of this story that that you would like. But um, if I kind of come forward a bit, you start ending up with the justice system in various ways, and I'm a bit interested about your experience because you had some pretty positive experiences in the justice system. Do you want to talk about what worked well and what didn't work so well through that part of your time? Okay, well, the justice system, um, well, where did it be? Because, <laughs> like, I have been in secure welfare, which is, mm. like, like, it's not even juvenile, but it's like juvenile. And obviously um, that made a massive impact with the workers that was there, you know, um, the ones that cared, you know, this now went through to you, et cetera, et cetera. But then obviously um, getting into the older system, um, the supports, um, obviously the juvenile, I mean, the prison, um, obviously the prison is a prison, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of faults in there. You didn't talk about whether or not there was much support for you in Dame Phyllis Frost, actually. You talked about the ARC list being a support, but I was interested to know, did you get any supports when you were in Dame Phyllis Frost? Not really. I, unfortunately, um, you don't get much access to a lot of supports when you're in Dame Phyllis unless you have been sentenced. And then when you are sentenced, then there is more opportunities and um, varieties. Like, you know, so example, if I got sentenced in prison and I did my time in there, then there would be actually housing op options out there for me. You know, I'd be able to get supports in housing and, you know, supports in this and supports in that. Like, and because I was only in remand, I, I, look, I did get supports in getting my um, proof of age card. I got, like, you know, and the education system in there is actually excellent. I have mm. to admit, you know, you actually get a variety of, you know, you can do courses in there and at least, you know, you're not sitting there wasting your time, you know, even though you're meant to sit there and do your time for your crime, et cetera, et cetera. At least you get to use it wisely and make you think that there is an opportunity. You can do something with your life. You can go somewhere, you know what I mean? Um, I don't think that there was any um, counselling support in there. There was none at all. Um, not that I know of. Um, and obviously there was groups, you know, to sit there and um, like behavioural, you know, changes, dealing with the emotions. And there's groups like that. So there was a lot of supports like that, but I guess the main supports in most systems um, and most case scenarios is um, probably, you know, counselling or, you know. But, um, but as you're on remand, that wasn't as available to you as if you had been charged. That's what you're saying. I, I, don't, I don't think that, um, I don't even know if... Um, counselling or anything like that is actually available to anyone in prison I'm not too sure I doubt it I've never heard anything about it I don't I've, I don't even think I had a cop service because okay. all you get to do is work you got gym you got this you got that you got the medical system there but that is like it is actually a joke you know because like, I remember when I um, end up in a massive car accident the day before I end up um, in incarcerated I was actually pretty sore like I, I didn't go to hospital or anything. I ran, you know, because I wanted to see my children before. You know, I didn't want to get it locked up. And obviously I had a broken nose. Like, I had two black eyes and obviously the girls from prison said, look, you've got a broken nose with me. You know, you've recognised because you've got bruises all there. That's not possible. But well, the biggest thing is my ribs. I could not breathe. I could not move or anything like that. And it took me about a month to be able to see someone get an X-ray just for them to turn and say, no, there's nothing wrong. And by then, well, obviously nothing's going to be wrong. It's been four long weeks. You know, if I had a fraction line or something like that, it would have, yeah. So the system in there with the medical, it is actually a joke. I've seen ladies out there that um, you know, are pregnant. They don't get the uh, um the care that they need. And then there's some lady there that actually ended up losing her child because she didn't get this, you know, the right amount of care. You know, not taken seriously. If there was something wrong, it would take ages. You know what I mean? So that is actually very shocking. The um the medical system, whatever it is, in there. Um, as I said, for counselling, there was nothing. I don't think there was nothing at all. Um, and housing, which is like the biggest thing, like a lot of people constantly keep going back into prison because it's like, what's the point? If, I, if I'm homeless just now, what's going to stop me from going and run a mark? Because at the end of the day, prison, you got you got um, stability. You have a roof over your head. You have food. You this and that. You know, so it's actually not that bad. You know, and um, in the housing is only offered to you if you have been sentenced. If you're remanded, there's no help. And I remember I sat there and I begs the system i don't want to get out i don't want to get out don't release me and you know what they actually released me and gave me granted me bail to where where did i have to go i had nowhere to go and they put me in a hotel where from the hotel where was i going to go from the hotel and they put me straight back to square one where i would go and reef and do everything like that so yes it, it it is pretty it's a joke it's really actually a joke the system 
yeah, so there's a lot of pros and cons. So how did you get on the ARC list? Um, I got on the ARC list, um, I think I remember um, someone, I, I can't exactly remember, someone brought it up to me and they said that, you know, you might be able to be put on that when you, because, you know, you obviously have, you know, mental health issues or something like that. Like, have, give it a shot and speak to your lawyer and bring it up to it. So I brought it up to my lawyer about it. I'm pretty sure. I think, I don't know if it was a lawyer or a friend mentioned it to me. But, but you had to raise it. No one else was saying, actually, this is a pathway with no. me. You might want to go down. You had to yeah. kind of go, can I go to the ARC list? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure I had mm. to raise my hand up and I said that to my lawyer and they're like, yeah, that could that could be a possible uh, decision and choice. Or something. So then they got, they looked into it and then that's when um, um, they, I, I had to do a psychology, I go and see the courts, the psychologist and stuff like that. And she had to do a report and see if I was eligible. And that's where she underlined a diagnosis me with you know, severe depression, yada, 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 um, and um, borderline personality disorder, which that granted me to be, become um, accepted on um, ARCLIX. Um, so yeah, I'm, I had to bring it up and I guess, um, yeah. Yeah. Tell me about, I mean, you, you talk a little bit about it in your statement, but what, what did going to the ARC list, what, what did that offer you? How did that help you? What would you suggest about things we should consider in the future? The ARC list has offered me, honestly, a second chance at life, a second chance at life. You know, um, it is like a savior, honestly. Um, they sit there, they, they don't look down upon you. They sit at your level. They try to understand you and work what type of person you are. And they don't sit there and make the decision up front, you know. They sit there and they try to work with you. Okay, so what happened that made, yeah, I'm going to put you with this support, this and that, and see if you can do something with your life, basically, you know. Yeah, and we're going to, yeah, and they made me come back every month, you know. Obviously, until I was like heavily pregnant my um, youngest, then they're like, okay, you know what? You can come back in every second or third month, you know. They were becoming more lenient. But I did come, I had to be there for the judge um, every month. And they were just, they were just checking up, see your progress and how far and what you've done with your life, yada, yada, yada. But even if they had the support, you had to work at the same, yada, yada. Um, but they really give you a chance. They, they analyze you, they see if you're going to do anything, yada, yada, yada. And yeah, they work with you. Like, I, I guess the ARC list, with the amount of charges that I was facing, and I, you know, they, they saw more potential in me. They saw what, you know, the, what I could have been, you know, what, you know, I, okay, there was a speed hump in, in my life. Obviously, the upbringing, this and that, I didn't have this many opportunities given to me, you know, the, 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 the department basically. I was a ward of the state. They should have, you know, had a roof over my head by the time I was 18, my own place, you know, set me up. But they left me nothing. You know, they wiped my hands off and left me with my ex-abusive partner and see you later, you know, no care factor. So then they were seeing, you know, seeing where it was at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, if she wasn't in this position, she wouldn't have been in this position to get into this position, to get into that position and end up where we are here today. So honestly, I think I was on an list for a good two years. I think maybe you're an I can't yeah, exactly it, it's a while. I think you're on quite a while. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And they gave me chance after chance after chance after chance. They saw me suffering up. Especially, you know, I not like to mention any names, but there was one certain judge that, you know, I don't know what she saw in me and honestly, she broke me, you know, and I remember when I got locked up and I was on video link and stuff like that, I cried. I'm like, I'm sorry, it's not like I don't mean to shit in your face because that's how I felt like, you know, and she gave me so much you know, I was meant to be on bail, signing at this other play session three times a week. And then there was this other play session I was meant to sign in once a week, you know, uh, no, every single day for the rest of the week, you know. And I didn't do any of that, you know. And I was legit skinny on thin ice. And yet she still gave me another chance. She kept giving me another chance when I should really be in jail, you know. But she saw a lot more than I saw in myself and she believed in me. And I guess... You know, like obviously, I don't know where I would be if I didn't fall pregnant with my youngest because, you know, I just gave up in life. You know, I had a housing worker when I came out of prison once and she she saw a lot of potential in me, you know. And, she, like, I know how workers are, you know. If um if you don't stay in contact or touch this and that, they're just going to wipe your hands. Yep, see ya, close your case. But this worker didn't do that. She even came to my shared accommodation. She came after me, even though I wasn't answering my phone calls. It's not just to say, yeah, Merry Christmas. just want to say how you are, this and that, you know. And that's what I'm saying. The big care factor. You know, so it changed a lot. But the ARC list, the, the judges and everyone, like, you know, they, I don't know, they, they, 
they changed changed my life completely around they you know um even if I failed pregnant and stuff like that, you know, um, and I wasn't on the uplist, I would probably be facing jail for a real long time. My co been a cop's three and a half years, you know, and I had probably a bit more severe charges than him, you know, with um, threats to kill, et cetera, et cetera. I have no, I have no idea. But um, I would be facing that long, you know, and it, I'd be having a child in prison, stuff like that. But, you know, so I'm actually very grateful that the ARCLIS, you know, took on board me, gave me an opportunity and, they were very patiently, I'm telling you, yeah, very yeah, patient. Yeah. I wouldn't be that patient with me, you know. I actually honestly did not care. But they kind of hung in there, didn't they? Yeah, they really did. They really did. And I'm very grateful. They honestly changed my life. Like, I would not be where I am today if I wasn't for the arc list. And I couldn't, I, I couldn't be any more grateful, you know. At the time when I just didn't care, someone believed, someone cared. And mm. they gave me, like, legit, they gave me a second chance at life. You know, like, wow. it's amazing that, you know, I got no conviction, you know, like, and, you know, to clear, and the police agreed with that just so that I be able to, you know, have a career at some point in my future because, like, you know, that's what I wanted to do. Back then I never knew what I wanted to do with my life and now, you know, here I am sober, I'm living an actual life and open my eyes to this world and I've realised how wonderful this world is and what I wanted to do with my life. You know, I've actually got goals, dreams and stuff like that and it is amazing because most people, if they've got these there it goes you know if you have conviction and you, you try to go for a job not bad luck you know there goes you know so i yeah um, tell, tell me a little bit about your goals and dreams what are you what are you well, hoping for i would i've always dreamt of um being become a midwife you know um doing that industry obviously at this point of time um it's probably not in on my cards as i'm a single mom to three kids and you know obviously you need available times for that um, so I've put that on hold for now, but, um, obviously I, I, I'm, I've never been so ego to boost, to do something with my life. Like, you know, so, and even with this pandemic and everything like that, you know, I feel like, um, I've had, you know, signs and stuff like that. So actually at the moment I'm doing like an eyelash extension course, you know, um, and I was thinking, you know, eventually like, when I do manage to get the funds, I would like to do an IPL laser course, you know, and like maybe even start up my own business, you know, um, or even like I was looking into um, becoming a real estate agent, you know, if, if that's if, you know, with my history, I don't know, if, you know, but like there is so many courses that I'm actually willing to do because I'm actually so ego to go and work. And obviously my daughter's at this age now where she can go a couple of hours without me, you know, so I've, I have gone and enrolled into um, childcare for her, but obviously with this pandemic now, yeah. it's put to a halt. So at least it gives me something to get my brain going and do an eyelash extension course, which, you know, would do me really good because I, I know a lot of people that, you know, it, it's like the thing. But yeah, my main goal is uh, eventually I would like to become a midwife. And even if um, I can't do that, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that my past will not come and affect, affect me. Um, you know, so my nerves is just a bit iffy, but I'm still going to go for it. But at the moment, I've got so many RGs that I feel like I'm about to burst. But, you know, I get to do this, you know, and it's, it's great. Good so hear. Yeah, really good to hear. And as you say, it's about, I, I guess what you're describing is that you're looking at the possibility that there could be these things, which is somewhat thing you wouldn't have done, you know, back in the past when some of those other periods were happening. It's pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. Pretty cool. Exactly. So, yeah. Can you can you come to the kind of because you're off the arc, you're off the um, going back in with the arc, aren't you yeah. now? Yeah. I, so, yeah. So, so what supports it. what supports are you getting now? Um. Well, the supports I'm getting now. I sort of have my housing worker that um actually does kind of um support me. Like I'm surprised she hasn't closed the case, even though we don't keep much touch base. But my main support is um is my psychologist or psych nurse. Um, he's my main support and it's mainly the only support I really have. Um, I, like I did have to, when I got custody of my kids, when the department gave me my um, two kids, um, I had to flee from my home um, and they put us into a um, family violence refuge um, around about November last year. So I had a lot of support at the point of time, but unfortunately um, I was in my own transitional housing, you know, so I finally had that stability and then- And then you had to go. Yeah, and then not like everyone's like, it's all right, we'll find you another one. And here I am stuck private renting. And it's just like, well, I had five, six different supports from different companies, and not one of them could actually help me put me in, in a stable, you know, situation. But, um, and left me basically on my own. So, like, there's a good example there. I had a lot of support around me, but yet not, none of them were doing anything. And it was down to me. You know what I mean? I had to step up and push and do whatever I could for me and my kids. 
So yeah, did, at the moment, is, is, just so I understand, is your psych nurse with Northwestern Mental Health? Is that that yes. part of the story? Right. So you're in the Northwestern Mental Health. Yes. Family. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you haven't needed any admissions or any other support. You see your psych nurse at whenever it works for you. Yeah. Is that how? Yeah, it's basically. Um, yeah, exactly. And um, no, he's very. Um, it's very supportive. Like I, I'm meant to be seeing him every week or so like that, but um, I guess, you know, um, I haven't heard from him in the last two, three weeks and uh, he gives me my space, you know, unless like I feel like, and he knows me if I really need, or I'm not coping well, or that old messaging, you know, and he'll call me and he'll be there instantly. Um, I guess the one thing is that he's sitting there um, trying to encourage me about going on back on antidepressants because my PTSD is just, yeah, I, I go through massive waves, you know, and the, the, like you know, and thankfully for my kids, I, I, I don't give up. Um, but see, his even biggest concern is when I don't care and I stop caring. That's a very dangerous point because I can go from a hundred to a zero, and when I don't care, game's over. Like I honestly don't care what happens, you know. Um, that's when reckless me comes in. But um, he will sit there and talk to me about it and stuff like that. And like now, this is how long we've been working. Like, you know, I'll sometimes call him, like, you know, and we'll sit there and talk about it. And I'll sit there and talk about. My, my problem with things that, and I'll start sitting there analyzing and giving all these options and this and that, and he'll be like, There you go. So, I half the times I don't even need him, it's just him because like, usually he would be sitting there analyzing and giving me, you know, trying to work it out with me. But sometimes I don't even need that, I just need but him to sit there and listen a and chance like, to talk. Yeah, exactly. And if, yeah. I'm, if I'm not spot on, you know, you know, I'm a bit wrong, you know, I'm giving myself the benefit of the doubt, and he'll be like, Okay, look no no and then, you know so it's it's really good you know i think that's the only main support i need because he is actually really doing something unlike other supports i i agree okay they did help me move and stuff like that i agree but you know and my stress levels you know it's gone to the point where i start you know my body is not reacting to like oh, i'm having an irregular heartbeat you know um my chest starts hurting and stuff like that you know so that's where, you know, my psych's like, you need to get on antidepressants. You need to, like, you know, it will help you with it. And, like, obviously, I'm just like, no, I'm, I can do this. I don't like medication, but, you know, I'm starting to give in because I've noticed the big dips myself and there's no support elsewhere when the department is actually involved, two men to be supporting me and my daughter, and they're not. So there's yeah. another fail in the system, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, you, you, you describe a story of systems that haven't always been there when you've needed them and supported you exactly i'm, I'm so trying much. to if, if we're the you know our remit is about the mental health system and we are interested in how that interfaces with the court system so the arc list and those things are kind of in our our interest because we're trying to understand because people are distressed shouldn't mean they end up in jail if there are other things that can happen as part of that that can keep them out of jail and help them get back on track but if you, if you were kind of making suggestions to us about um, the things that you think would have helped you in your sort of psychological distress along the way, is there anything you think that would have made a difference? I think it feels like people are late to help you. That would be one thing. It seems like people kind of, you ask, you're actually quite good at asking for help by the sounds of it. But yeah, late. Really have. not many people are at that point. You know, no one likes to ask for help. And I was never like that, you know, because... Obviously, people ask when they do gain the courage to ask for help, they get shut down. You know what I mean, uh, yeah. there's no help there, and then they're like, what's the point? And, you know, and for someone to not be out, like, you know, doesn't like asking for help, for them to be able to ask for help is a big, big thing, you know. And um, when that's not there, or they just get shut down. It's like, what's the point? You know, mm. there's no point, and no one will ever ask for help, and no one just sit there and they'll drown themselves in it, you know, and either if they drown themselves in alcoholism, drug abuse, you know, or end up committing suicide, if you know what I mean, like if it gets too much. Um, so. But there's something with you about, you're pretty, you're pretty clear about what you want. You don't want something else. Like, don't give me that. I haven't asked for that. Give me what you're asking for. So the parenting stuff is a good example of that. So there's something about people listening to you and actually hearing what it is that you're saying to them, not what they think, you know, and linking in with the, okay, Whitney's saying she wants this, not what I think she wants as an outsider. But there's also, I mean, a lot of what you're talking about about some of this system is also partly the mental health system, but also some of this other practical support system, if I could put it that way. Your housing, your parenting, um, you know, lawyers that actually suggest to go to the ARC list before you've got to think of it. 
But, yeah. but there's something about the kind of practical components of it for you, isn't it? That that along your way, they would have helped if they'd got in there and got in there faster. Yeah, exactly. And, Is that um, fair to say? Yeah. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, you know, with the mental health system, um, like, I guess, and like, I remember when I was um, at the suicide point and I was at the, um, at the train station and I had um, the PCOs pull me over. I'm like, you know what? Just kill me. I don't give a shit. They call the ambulance, you know, and try to admit me. And the next morning I wake up and the point of being, you know, PTSD is just like a, it's like a borderline personality disorder. It's the exact, exact same thing, you know, your mind just goes, doo, doo. and all you have to do is sit there and tell them what they want to hear and they let you go. doesn't matter with about the circumstances of if you just try to kill yourself or, you know, you were down and depressed the next day. Yep, girl, sweet, yep, sweet, you're free to go. And just like, there you go. That's where the mental health system is failing. Like, I understand, you know, people say, yeah, I'm fine. It's that, but they should be able to look upon and see and analyze it, what's going on. Okay. Say, look, this person's not stable. This happened. They're just saying this. So then they, you know, they should not be able to let them go on their own free will. If there is something underlying or something seriously wrong and they actually try to self harm or, you know, they're not mentally stable, they should not be able to give them the right to leave when they want. You know, that's just basically, allowing them to go and do something stupid again you know and that's not where the system is not helping with their mental health and she's like yep i don't care next you know so that's where it's, it's like a big fail right there you know because i could sit there like, and there's been multiple times in the past that they've tried to throw me in a soft board you know and i remember when i went to the hospital and i you know, know the doctors and they tried to call catching on me i ran for my life you know, and I, I remember that night because I was sitting in, I got my friend's face that I was, you know, staying at, but she wasn't living there. And I was going to jump out of my second, like, you know, she had a double story window. I was ready to jump out the, you know, jump out, go, end it, you know. And I was on a phone to my friend, like, they called me at the time and he came instantly, he came and collected me, you know. So when you were standing there at the train station with the PSOs really distressed and actually becoming, um, you know, kind of saying you want to end it. So I was asking you when, you know, at those periods of acute distress, obviously sometimes the ambulance has picked you up and taken you to the ED. What do you think would be the most helpful at those periods of time? Like, what do you think would have helped you to be one heard so that people actually understood it and that gave you the response that would have been more helpful than just sticking you in the ED and you then talking your way out of it? Have you got any suggestions for us? Not really, but um, apart from probably taking me serious because, you know, me being that state of time, I didn't take anything serious. I didn't, you know, so it's just a little bit hard to understand. But, like, to help me at that point in time, maybe taking me serious and giving me more help, more support, you know, instead of just releasing me and just let me go on my way without anything, you know. Um, and I know, at the, at the end, I know at the end of the day, it's like everyone's own free will to, you know, ask for help and et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I don't know. I honestly I couldn't explain. And in that context, do you think, um, it, it, are they sort of practical supports as well as, as the kind of more emotional support? Or do you think sometimes it's that you really need a practical response at that point? No, well, look, the PS, PSOs, the emotional response would be, you know, kind of good as well as practical, practical you know. Um, I, I guess it's, it can't be one or the other. It has to be both. Okay. So, yeah. And we've been having an idea that the ED might not be the place to go and sort that out, that the ED might not be the place where you should take people. No, because the ED, like, you know, they're already... Um, they're already busy. They're already dealing with a lot of people, you know, that's, you know, needs more serious, you know, attention, just like, you know, someone's dying or, you know, someone's seriously injured or, you know, their life's, on, you know, so that is like the worst part to go and dump someone with, you know, mental health issues and stuff like that. Because at the end of the day, sorry, but they've got more important people to attend to, you know what I mean? Which, you know, it's someone's life, you know, and so I can't understand it's just mental health and compared to someone's life, but there needs to be like their own, like, mental health ED, you know, like yeah. their own kind of hospital, whatever it is, no, I don't exactly know, but like there's somewhere else where they should be able to take it instead of emergency department because as I said, we're not going to be taken seriously at all, you know. They've got hey, I know you. <laughs> 
Um, I'm, I'm aware we're coming up to time and I'm sure, you know, your time is pretty precious and, and the tolerance of you being with us might not last for too much longer, um, which I absolutely Dad. understand. Um, is there anything that, um, you know, we're looking at the whole of the mental health system, both systems that support children, you know, like when you were little, as well as the adult system. So it's not just about yeah. thinking about and any part of the system. I is there, a agree there There needs to be a, like a lot more for children because that is where it's actually the most needed as young, you know, because um, if things are left too long as they're young, then that's when it's going to become as an adult issue. And then as an adult issue, it's more harder to work through than working through with a child. So for um, the mental health system for a child, I believe is actually really, really strong because it will be able to help and prevent, you know, a lot more older people where it's going to take ages to be able to overcome everything. So I, I know there is no more importancy, but there is. If we start working, you know, and have more available to children and their mental health and stuff like that, then, you know, it will save us a lot of, you know, longer, you know, problems are where, you know, the mental health issues and stuff like that's going to lead to, you know, crimes and stuff like that, you know. And I'm yeah. Not going to be yeah. Shush. <laughs> She's fine. Um, okay. I'm going to draw this to a close, but I just want to say, Whitney, thank you so much for your time and, you know, for being generous to share your story again. I, I know how frustrating it is, but for us to get... Hello, gorgeous. For us to get stories from um, from people who are trying to get support now and in their past is so important and it's so valuable to us that we hear from, you know, people who have, um, have stories about trying to and helping us to make the system better. Um, you know, your, your story is remarkable in the sense of your level of resilience and capacity to kind of keep moving forward. So fantastic to hear and well done. And you've got a gorgeous daughter there. She's absolutely divine. So um, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you this afternoon. Thank you very much. You too. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.